Matthew Arnold Arnold Stern. Thank you so much for coming on and joining the Uniweb interview show. I'm your host, Matthew Whiteside. Great first name. Um, Matthew, thanks for coming on and joining me today. I really appreciate your time. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Awesome. It's, so, seven in the, in, it's seven in the morning here in California, but I am duly caffeinated, so we're ready to go. Perfect. <laughs> All caffeinated and pumped and ready to rock. Well, That's for those right. who don't know, uh, Matthew Arnold Stern is an award-winning author, public speaker, and technical writer. Um, and you do have a book, a novel coming out this November called Amiga. Yes. Fantastic. Would you please tell the entire world, the billions of people watching this, what Amiga is? And well, I will sit here I, like... <laughs> yes, just like that. The I've peaked listened. fingers. Okay. I'll tell you first about Amiga the novel, and then I will tell you about Amiga the computer. Perfect. Amiga the, wait, Amiga the novel is about a woman who's going through a variety of crises in terms of her family and her career, including having a new boss that, who's old enough to be her daughter. And she's trying to cope with her problems by looking back at her past when she was young and starting off in the computer industry in the mid-1980s. And she may find a solution to her problems from an old computer, the Commodore Amiga. Mm. Now, what is the Commodore Amiga? Um, one of the things I think a lot of people don't realize is that when the computer industry started, it wasn't just these two brands that we know about, like a Apple and the PC. Right. Dozens of companies wanted to get into computers, including Mattel. They even had a computer called Intellivision. Ooh. So the people who make Barbie dolls were starting to get in, trying to get into <laughs> the computer industry. Well, they know how to make plastic, right? It's silicone plastic. It's, those are all important key components in computers. <laughs> yes. They even they did have um, some electronic games. If you grew up in the 70s and 80s, they had like this Mattel thing called electronic football, oh, where wow. it's a little push button game with little LEDs you ran or run around. But yes. one of the yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just say it's amazing just thinking of because I grew up in the late or er, early 90s, late 80s. I was born in 86. The jump from, like, even that, I remember the Commodore gaming system and the Atari and stuff like that and the, the computer and all the graphical software that was out then. The jump from then to now is mind-boggling. Um, but to talk about, like, playing touch football with little LED lights running around, yeah. like little pinpricks of light moving around, it's it's incredible. Yeah. Sorry, but continue, please. No, no, that's that's fine. Because you mentioned the Commodore system, and Commodore was very popular in the 80s because they had a computer called the Commodore 64 that right. you might remember. It yeah. was very successful because unlike IBM, which was doing well in business, and Apple, which was more expensive, the Commodore came out with an all-in-one computer called the 64, and it had advanced graphics for the time it had built-in animation and it had a audio chip called the sid chip and mm -hmm. if you're into sometimes electronic music today we'll have like 8-bit music or sid chip music with a mm -hmm. lot of beeps and bloops and <laughs> synthesizer beats yeah that came from the original commodore 64 wow so what happened was in the 80s, com computers were advancing really quickly. Mm -hmm. And that was when the Macintosh came out in 1984 and it introduced the graphical user interface where you have mice and icons and windows. Again, right. something we take for granted today. So Commodore <laughs> wanted to get into that market. Yeah, it, it's sort of weird how much Everything we use today were, is had its beginnings in the 80s. Yeah. And computers that, because these were pretty big size computers, they could yeah. take up a full desk. 
But uh, today we have computers that are many times more powerful, and we call them smartphones, and they fit in our pocket. And all the technology we use today started off with these old computers. Right. It's mind-boggling to think about in just 30-plus 30, 30 years, um, the growth of the machines and, and the ideas that people have been able to cram into such tiny devices that we're walking around connected to the entire world um, with the touch of a button on a, on a, on a flat piece of um, silicone and, and glass. It, it, it's, it blows my mind. Is this in, in was that the whole uh, inspiration for Amiga was just the, the historical relevance of what's happened and transpired over this over this time period? Well, that was one of the main inspirations. The other thing, too, is being somebody who's grown up in who was at the beginning of this industry. And now we're sharing our workplace with people who. As you mentioned, you were somebody who was born in the 80s and grew right. up with this technology. And there is a concern that we have as we get older is, are we, may, are we obsolete now? Because, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, here we are, we created these, you know, these wonderful tools. And now we have generations of coworkers and managers and bosses who grew up with that and 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 they, they know the stuff inside and out mm -hmm. they talk about terms like digital natives and digital immigrants the digital natives people <laughs> who yeah right. people who were born with this stuff right like like four-year-olds who were able to use ipods and ipads like it's nothing they they figure out how to code i mean there's little kids that there's gaming now for code like coding where little kids can learn how to code at like five years old yes in fact my granddaughter we saw her the other day she had taken my wife's iphone and she was trying to record her own youtube video using her toys and her and the iphone and what's amazing is is that kids have really love really love a lot of videos on YouTube, yeah. And especially like there's this whole range of videos where adults are playing with toys and they make yep. up stories like the way that kids do, and kids just eat them up. Absolutely, yeah. There's a huge my my boys love watching that kind of stuff. It's uh. But but to the the point where the, where the uh, digital natives too like these kids are making these incredible videos online that like it's taken me years to figure out how to do and they're just like getting on there and making it happen in seconds it's it's a a new form of genius uh, evolution of the way we perceive and uh, use our technology yes. And this is what's really interesting about the the Amiga specifically. It was the first computer that was synchronized with popular video signals, with the uh, NTSC that we use in the United States and other countries, and PAL, which is popular in Europe. So mm -hmm. with the Amiga, it was finally possible to produce animations and titles on a computer and then post them out as part of a video and then have a production ready. Right. And there were actually some videos that were produced with an Amiga. I believe uh, the Dire Straits song, Money for Nothing, was animated on an Amiga. Nice. I think uh, Max Headroom, probably okay. the most 80 things that you ever see. And you know, <laughs> I'm not going to try to imitate that. Like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Babylon 5 did a number of animations using the Amiga. So wow. this is where the technology that we're using right now got its start was on the Amiga. Yeah. So was was uh, was writing this novel a uh, way of also answering a question for you in terms of where we're headed? Yes. I think one of the things that I tried to answer is the is that when we see things that happen to us in 
you know, things that are going on in the world, because I do touch on the 2016 presidential election in this book because it was written during that time. Okay. So y'all run into this question about what's going to happen next. How can we deal with the future? And what and how, and one of the things that we can do is look back at our past and say, okay, how did we cope with this before? What was the worst thing we experienced, and how did we get through that? Right. So that was one of the things that I was really interested with this book. In yeah, history about. history can be our greatest teacher if we if we listen to it. If we don't just ignore it and brush it aside as oh, that's old news, right? Yes, and. Like as we are talking today, we this is the day after the fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral. Right. And what's interesting is about history and how history builds upon itself and how there I remember seeing there were pictures of a fire that happened in Notre Dame. I mm-hmm. don't remember it was over a hundred years ago. And the fact that it survived all these various wars and plagues and and um there's a there's a lot with history that we can learn from including our own personal histories and i wanted to touch on that in the book too yeah and with the uh with the whole idea of people who have have grown up with the technology and you're talking about this this woman who's working in this office and her boss is you know young enough to be your daughter um I talked. I had to talk with my brother about this because he he does he's done coding, um, and building um, you know computers and that kind of thing since we were kids. Like he he taught himself all this stuff, and he says it's the hardest thing he's ever had to do, um, but he's continued to grow and teach himself how to do it and how to do it. But the, and then there are these people who are coming along who are just like savants at it. And my whole thing was, it's so important that there are people like him and. And other people that come along and are willing to put in as much work as it takes to learn what is necessary to get over any hump imaginable. Because the people who are, you know, savants and really great at things are great for creating new opportunities and expanding. But when they come to a point where it's like, well, this is difficult, we tend to find that they don't move any further. There's not that I'm going to figure out a way to get past this. You know, and I think from from history learning that there's always a way to get past it. No matter what happens, we can find a way to move forward. Um, And having that mentality that I'm going to overcome this as opposed to this is so easy for me. I just do it however. You know, there's there's so much experience to be gained and knowledge to be gained from that mindset. Is that kind of how the the character is portrayed in the novel? Yes, because one of the things that's, certainly true from my experience in the computer industry is that we learn as we go along because technology changes so fast that there's no there's no book learning that you could use i mean yes you could learn some fundamentals in classes and i did take a programming class in college which was done on punch cards which would give you an idea (laughs) about how old i am (laughs) nice that's and you could uh, and you could understand the principles like but because technology changes you have to adapt to what's new and what's different because th- there's a lot of things that you don't learn in books and especially as the books as things are being created as you go along and so much of the technology that we gain today was from trial and error. There were a lot of false starts in this yeah. industry. And it's not always clear. As I mentioned, there were dozens of computer companies that started off in the 80s, and not all of them were going to make it. Commodore went bankrupt in 1994, and there were times during the 90s when even Apple wasn't sure that they were going to survive. Right. And they had to adapt by going into new types of technology. So mm-hmm. that that's the thing about this bit, about this bit, well, about any business actually is being able to adapt to all the changes that are going on. Right. Yeah. Adapt and overcome. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so this this book will be out in November of this year. Yes. Right. And it's uh, being you're self publishing. Is that correct? 
No, this is uh, this is going through a small press. It's called Black okay. Rose Writing. So Black this Rose was, Writing. Yes. And yeah. this is the first time a novel of mine was selected for publication. Awesome. And it's a really, it's a much different experience. It's great to work with a team and work with other, get advice from other people and get their feedback instead of trying to figure it all out on your own. So it's a, I, <laughs> you mean, I it's, like you mean it's nice to have support, huh? <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> does it, it doesn't hurt to have some support. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on that. Very excited for well, you. Thank you. So, so you've had, you have published other books in the past, uh, by self publishing. Um, and you, you've done public speaking. We were talking before the interview, uh, a little bit about a nonfiction book that you wrote about public speaking, right? Yes, it's called Mastering Table Topics, which I have right here. I'm trying awesome. to look at the screen here. <laughs> and it was based on my experience with Toastmasters. And I don't know if how many of your viewers are familiar, but Toastmasters is sort of the... Uh, program for public speaking it's been around since the 1920s right and it's a learning by doing program where you get up and you get opportunities to speak and you get feedback from other speakers and it's a great opportunity to get comfortable with getting in front of a crowd and learning to express yourself and i've uh I've heard of Toastmasters, and it's something that I've wanted to pursue. Are there like Toastmasters available in? Is it available in all cities, or like how how does how do you get involved in, in Toastmasters? Well, you go to the Toastmasters website, which is Toastmasters dot org, and there are chapters throughout uh, the world, and oh. you just and the, and there's they are available at lots of different times and lots of different places. <clears throat> there are even companies that have their own Toastmasters clubs. And so it's very easy to find a club that meets your schedule. Yeah. And and then you go to the meetings. They charge uh, dues every six months. Mm -hmm. You can go as often as you like. And they have manuals of projects to work from and handling all different types of speeches. And one of the exercises in Toastmasters is called Table Topics, which is the inspiration okay. for the book. Right. So, so what? Yeah, yeah go, go ahead. On. So no, you go. Topic, <laughs> you go. Okay. It's like Southern California, driving in Southern California. You go. You go. <laughs> you go. <laughs> but um, in t Table Topics, it's impromptu speaking, and you have one to two minutes to speak, you're asked a question, and then you come up with a well-developed answer. And the book takes you through the process of how to answer a question. You first have to listen to the question. You begin to figure out what points you want to cover. And what they say in public speaking is say what you're going to say, say it, and tell them what you just said. So. And that helps stick that information in the reader, in your listener's mind. It also helps you remember as you're delivering the speech. So the book talks you through the process of coming up with an answer. And it also has 750 sample questions that you could use for practice. And if that's not enough <laughs> questions on my Twitter feed, which is at Matt, M -A -S writer. It, uh, I have a, I post a daily table topics question with the hashtag mastering table topics. Yes, I see it. Your last question was, what building do you wish you could still visit? Yes. And that's, I, and I suppose that was based off of the Notre Dame Cathedral fire. Yes. Right. Right. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> So I want to ask you this about public speaking, too, because I feel like it's maybe one of the most popular, biggest fears for a lot of people. I know for me it was for a long time. Um, did you ever have a sense of impending doom when you got up in front of people and started speaking like you were going to die? 
Like, you know, your chest got tight, the throat started closing up, that kind of feeling? Uh, I don't think so, because, I, I first of all, I started off uh, performing on stage when I was in an elementary school. And okay. what's sort of interesting is that there's a lot of people who feel comfortable performing on stage or speaking through to big crowds but they don't feel comfortable talking one-on-one. So it's yeah. interesting it's how I, I think some of the things that help me is just understanding that people are here because they believe I have something of value to say and mm-hmm. to know that the audience is on your side, even in situations where let's say you're going to talk about a controversial subject. You know, people right. still want to listen to you, even if they want to listen so they can pick a point your parts later points later yeah. on. So they can yell at you later. <laughs> yeah, they can attack you on Twitter, but that's right. <laughs> yeah. So so eye contact to me is really important. And it's it gives you the sensation that you're talking to people instead of talking at people. Right. And you're not just here to deliver a speech. You're here to have a conversation. And it just makes it more comfortable. That's a great point. Yeah, really connecting with the people you're speaking to as opposed to just throwing a blanket over top of them with your words, right? Right. Here's my stuff. (laughs) So how long? It's fun that way, too. Yeah, I, I can I can imagine. I have uh, I've I've had to get up and, and talk uh, before a couple different times, uh, and it's I feel like there's there's that anxiety is actually uh, excitement that I'm not sure what to do with in a lot of cases, and I feel like this might be true for a lot of people that it's it's an excitement of I want to be I want to go and give as much energy as possible but I'm afraid of what people are going to think of me if I do and like overcoming that anxiety of what other people think of me. And I think it's huge in, in to like with my age group and, and younger that we're all so concerned with what people, how we look because we're constantly, we, there's like there's cameras and mirrors and photographs everywhere of and filters to see how we look. And we're so concerned with this idea of, I must be perceived a certain way. Yes. You know? And I do touch on that in Amiga about some of the, because my kids are in there, are what you would call millennials. They're in their 20s. Okay. And I understand the frustration that they feel because, yeah, there is a lot of pressure put on younger people today that, especially with social media, especially when you see young people who become very successful very early on, and you have a hard time competing with that. But this is where history can help, because every generation goes through this. My generation went through that. Like, I grew up in the 70s, and we got it from both ends, because we got the kids from the 60s going, oh, these people are so lazy and self-entitled. They're not hip like we are. And then the yeah. generation after us, like, oh, they were so old and out of touch. And <laughs> it, It's hard either way. You just can't yeah. win. But So you just have to be yourself. I, yeah, that's uh, um, just being yourself. I think being on camera and the opportunity for all of us to be on camera so often is an opportunity for more people to wake up to the idea of just being authentic because nobody can, I I feel like the only reason I'm more comfortable on camera now than I've ever been is because I'm as authentic as I've ever been. Like I'm honest and true to who I am. And so I'm never like afraid that I'm going to slip up and, and my lie is going to come out. You know what I mean? Like there's no lying about anything anymore. It's just, but I I think that's important for us to kind of wake up to that idea of, we need more authentic people. Yes. In the world. And I think one of the important things to remember is that you have something important to say. You have value. 
And there are people out there who have something that they, uh, viewers that they want to hear. Uh, one of my favorite stories about writing and is that um, long to, about 10 years ago, I was a little league president, which if you ever get a chance to do that, don't. <laughs> but <it> was like, <laughs> Dude, I've, it, I was a little league umpire for, for when I was like 12 years old. I umpired little league. It was terrifying, man. I got cussed at by all these parents. I was like umping a nine-year-old's game. Yeah, it's bad. I understand. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's worse being the president, I'll tell you. Imagine I can imagine. <laughs> But there was a situation where we had a bunch of parents being Little League parents, and it led to a really bad experience for the kids who were on this all-star team. Yeah. And I wrote, and I just had just become president because we had a big rift in our league and they had nobody to take over as president. And I was volunteered. But um, like you go so I, so, yeah, you go do it. He looks like a nice guy. We'll let him <laughs> you we can write, make him do stuff. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and so I found myself in this situation, and what I did was I wrote a letter of apology to each of the kids because the situation was so bad. Wow. And the next season, uh, the parent of one of those little leaguers came up to me and said, you know, my kid was so upset about what happened last season that he was ready to quit. But when he got your letter, it made him feel so much better. And he decided to come back this season because your letter meant so much to him. And wow. to me, that is what it is to be successful in writing. You don't have to reach billions of people. If yeah. you can make a difference in one person's life, then you've succeeded as a writer. Yeah. No, it's, it's beautiful. And that's... Um... The way I try to approach it, it's it's a it's a hard thing to hold on to, especially if when you do start getting some form of success, because one you're like, oh, it is good, and then two you're like, I knew it, and three you're like, I'm the greatest, <laughs> and then I expect to have everyone in the world tell me how good I am and that it changed their life to the uttermost extent. At least that's my crazy th cra crazy way of thinking. But I, <laughs> I love that. I love that idea, though, um, because it is. It really is about changing. I, I feel like even uh, people who are like, I haven't sold any books or I haven't done this or I hasn't won any awards or it's not a bestseller. Like, we don't know if that book could have changed one person's life, saved somebody's life, took it, taken them to a, a, a place where they were able to escape in their mind for a, a moment of time to make their, their journey in this life a little bit more bearable. And, and that is a hundred percent what it's about. Yes. It's about connection mm -hmm. and it's about reaching out to somebody else with your writing and try to be, it, whether it's you're trying to inspire them or just trying to entertain them or whatever it is that you want to do, that understanding that you're that that's what makes it worthwhile and that's what evens out the highs and the lows of this business. Because it's very easy to get caught too much in the highs and then fall into despair like, oh my writing's crap and I'm crap. And... I know. It's so easy. <laughs> well, because it all it literally one person could say they love you. Or a thousand people could say they love you, but one person says they hate you. And for me, I'm like, I'm the worst person alive. This one person doesn't like what I did. I should never write again. You know, but if it was vice versa, if a thousand people said they hated me and that one person said, I mean, I, it's, it's, I don't know. It's just all about what we focus on. Um, I was going to ask you too. So we know kind of why you write because you want to be able to connect with other people. Who were some of the, the authors that inspired you, that connected with you when you, were, when you were growing up, that set you on this path? I think probably the most inspirational writer to me was Kurt Vonnegut. Okay. Because, um, and act actually the first hard copy novel that I ever bought for myself was uh, his novel Jailbird, 
1979. And I first got into Vonnegut when I was in high school. Uh, I was taking an advanced placement uh, English class, and they had us read Slaughterhouse Five, nice. which, which uh, it, it was a real eye opener. First of all, it had all sorts of words that we didn't typically run into in literature <laughs> classes, uh, right? And it was a contemporary book because when you're going to school, you see all of the, you you read all these long dead authors, everybody they've decided that these are classics and this is part of the canon that you need to read. Yeah. And here was Vonnegut, who uh, I think he died, what, about 10 years ago, I think. But wow. At the time, he was an active writer. He was producing new books, and they were funny and challenging and inspirational. And it was, and they tied in with his own personal experience with all these fantastic uh, science fiction elements. And it told it. What I got from it was that writing books was something that a person like me can do. Yeah. That it's not just because he came up from a middle class background. He had, uh, he was like an insurance salesman. Yeah. And so writing was something that was attainable. So it's not just the books themselves, but him as an author that was right. inspiration. Wow. Yeah. It's, it, it's all about connection, finding those people that, uh, we can relate to, to move us forward a little bit. It's very cool. Yes. Um, so Amiga is going to come out November of this year. Yes. Can we, ex are you working on another novel uh, at this time or are you taking a respite or is that, I don't even know if that's the right word, a break. <laughs> I like yeah. just using words sometimes. I don't know the meaning to, are you taking a break from writing anything or are you working on something else at the moment? Um, uh, I do have a work in progress. It's called Snow in Los Angeles, and it's set in L.A. after World War II, and it's about a family who's dealing with a terrible loss wow. and about a re French refugee who comes into their lives. And an opportunity in terms of getting involved with show business is going to press this family and force them to look at things that they've been ignoring for a long time. Wow. Very cool. That sounds, that sounds awesome. Um, let me ask you this, Matthew. Are there any uh, parting words that you'd like to leave the writing community, uh, your readers, anybody out there watching this? Well, I would say that to keep writing and write things that matter to you because the words that we have are important and they're necessary. We're going through a lot of changes as a society. And a lot of things are being uh, are, are being challenged, and a lot of things that are being questioned. And we have to adapt to the times, and we have to address the issues that people have now. So continue to write, continue to write about what matters, and just to say to the readers out there, be willing to step out from the genres you're used to, try something new. Look, try independent and small press and self-publish because there's a lot of great there's a lot of great writing out there and yeah. just it's it's waiting there for you that's yeah absolutely um i just realized this last night actually that i have like it's possible to evolve as a reader too like the things that i grew up on that i loved are not necessarily the things that i love to read now like i've yes my genre has changed, but also like I'm, I'm willing to read any genre if it spikes my interest, but also doing this, like there's so many, ta like you said, there's so many talented storytellers out there. Um, just give them a shot, right? Yes. Awesome. Well, Matthew Arnold Stern, thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. It was an absolute pleasure getting to talk to you and meet you for the first time. Uh, I wish you all the best of luck in the in the coming times with your book. And I'll leave a link in the description of this video. Um, you're, I know you're on Twitter. Um, that's how we connected. But are you, do you have a website available as well or anything else, anywhere else we can connect with you? 
Yes, I'm also at Facebook. I have a Facebook uh, authors page. Okay. Uh, MAS Writer. And also I have my own website, which is MatthewArnoldStern.com. Awesome. And I do post articles on a lot of different things. I, I think one thing I may start doing is a series of articles about the publishing experience, working with a with the press yeah. and what it's like, because I think there are a lot of people, especially writers, are they get a lot of confusing information about uh, do should I self publish? Should I? hold out for a traditional publisher. So I think it's good for people to get that, to look at both sides and figure out what works best for them. Absolutely. So at MatthewArnoldStern.com, right? Yes. All right. And I'll, I'll provide right. links to all that in the uh, description of this video. Matthew, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure talking to you, buddy. Yes, it's a pleasure talking to you too. Have a great Thank day. Thank you for having me. Yes, you too. Uh, Thank you for having you. me. My pleasure. Bye-bye.